Hello, and welcome to the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Andre Watson, commercial real estate broker and managing director of KW Commercial in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He specializes in investment sales on behalf of business owners and investors. He also consults with clients on commercial market evaluation, lease analysis, and contract negotiations. Andre and I have been extremely close friends for over 30 years of our lives, which means that we met in, when we were both in the womb. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no introduction that I could possibly give could encapsulate the journey this man has taken and where he has ended up as a result. This will be a fascinating journey into the life and career of this fascinating man. Andre, it is a pleasure and a privilege to have you on the podcast today. Mark, the pleasure is always mine, my friend. You're so good to me. <laughs> <laughs> You're so good to me. Thank you so much for having me, bro. I love that you have this. Um, thank you for asking me to come on. I really appreciate it. The, the reason why I wanted to have you on today is I want to give the audience, my audience, a real framework for for pursuing goals, for pursuing dreams, and, and the desires that they have for their lives. And I want to show you off as a model of what it looks like to, to dream, to have big goals, to not get those goals, to get up, to reinvent, and persist until you get everything you want. And, you know, we live in a time right now where we can really use some inspiration. So. I'm really looking forward to, to, to what you have to share today. Now, you and I have known each other a long time, but I actually want to go back before you and I met, back to the very beginning of your life. You had some really humble beginnings. Tell us a little bit about the start of your journey in life. I was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and um, my father was... Um, somewhat of a ladies' man. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, he was a smooth talker. And unfortunately, uh, he and my mother did not stay together. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, fortunately, though, my grandfather was a member of the Jamaican parliament. And uh, for that reason, you know, my mother was able to uh, support me and to provide you know, um, uh, she, she had the support that she needed, uh, you know, after I was born. So, um, you know, back in the 70s, and like, I guess going into the early 80s, um, you know, we were still in, in the heat of the Cold War, and Cuba being the communist country and being so close to Jamaica, um, uh, part, my, part of the one of the reasons that my, that my mother left Jamaica to come to the United States, uh, her mom and her sister were already here, number one. Uh, number two, um, there, there was concern that Jamaica would eventually go the way of Cuba. Mm. Okay, we, we would become a Marxist nation. Wow. And she didn't want to live under that. She didn't want for me to grow up under that because she knew the dangers of Marxism and socialism. And, um, you know, she set out to, to, um, to uh, um, come here and make a better life uh, for her and for myself. Now, during that time, she left me with uh, her grandmother, my great-grandmother. -grand and um, she lived in a place in Jamaica called Portland mm -hmm. or White River. And... You know, the house that her and my great-grandfather lived in, um, along with her mother, so it was my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother <laughs> and my great-grandfather who lived in this house. And, you know, the house did not have indoor plumbing and it did not have electrical power. Um, there was an outhouse for the bathroom and the kitchen was a little hut on the back side of the property. So, you know, yeah, we were poor. But nobody ever told me that, <laughs> you know. Like I didn't know I was poor. I was a little, I was a little baby and a little kid, you know. Right, right. Just um, having fun. Yeah. So, you know, um, 
uh, my mother would send money and toys and clothes for me like every other week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was, that was basically where I lived. That was where I stayed until uh, I came to uh, the United States at the age of about seven or eight. Yeah. Wow. And, and what was it like for you to come to the United States after having lived in Jamaica? The first time I came, um, it was, I was by myself mm. and I came for only for a month. My mom brought, brought me here for the month of August. I don't remember, remember what year it was, but I'll never forget it because like I had pizza for the first time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was all I recall having pizza. And I'm like, well, this is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Greatest thing ever, right? <laughs> Love America. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, I had water ice. And I was like, wow. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, it was, I, I mean, I was, I was put on the plane by myself. Mm -hmm. uh, the flight attendants, you know, attended to me. I sat up front and one of them sat next to me and, mm -hmm. you know, played, played, played with me and talked to me until I came here. And uh, they even took me up to the cockpit, you know, oh. where the pilots let me sit in one, of the, in one of the seats and I could look out the window, right? It was so cool. And, it, I mean, listen, it was a culture shock being a little, being a little boy of, you know, eight, seven or eight year, right. years old. It was, it was definitely different. You know, and um, my mom said to me, listen, the next time I send for you, it'll be permanent, but it's going to be a while. She said, it's probably going to be about a year or so. I, you know, I said, okay. You know, and all I wanted was pizza. <laughs> 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 you know, so um, that was, it, it was definitely a culture shock, especially for a little boy, which, you know, seven or eight, you're still a baby, you know, and, um, but it was, I found it to be fascinating because everything was so bright and there was so much coming from basically the backwoods of Jamaica, you know, living in a house with no indoor plumbing or, or electrical power to the house. But it was, it was fantastic. And I thought it was really, really cool as a little boy. When you and I first met, we were, we were in high school. At that time, what sort of dreams and aspirations did you have for your life you know how some people peak early in life mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um for example you know in school there are a lot of people that had uh that excelled academically yeah you know um uh they seem to know what they wanted and what they were going to be and uh i was like wow that's so cool and I'm thinking, am I an idiot? Because I have no idea what it is I want to do with my life, you know? Mm -hmm. And there were a number of things that made me look at myself differently, you know, than, than, than those that would see me from the external. While I never thought any of those things would stop me from being what I wanted to be, those, those were just some insecurities. And I'll share one of them with you is that I stutter, mm -hmm. right? I was born with it. My mom's side of the family, like almost everyone on my mom's side of the family, stutters, right? And, you know, that, that was something that, I don't want to call it a hindrance, but as a child, you know, people make fun of you. You know, whether, you know, even if it's your friends who joke around, right? Like, eh, stuff kind of stays in your head, you know? So that was something that I dealt with in my, in my head. At the time, I thought I wanted to be an actor, mm, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know why, <laughs> now looking back, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I have no idea why. I just thought making movies was so cool and the whole, the, the whole process and, you know, that whole business was yeah. such a cool business. And, you know, given the way that you and I met was when we were in the auditorium, I believe, if mm -hmm. memory serves me right. You mm -hmm. know, I just, I thought that, the, you know, being in that environment, you know, yeah. um, I was a football player. I played sports all, all, all my life. Um, but for some reason, I, I just thought that I wanted to be an actor, mm. you know, and that was one of my biggest hopes and dreams at that time. And, you know, moving forward from that, I realized that I wanted to be rich and famous. B being an actor 
would be a way of me achieving that objective. I just saw having large amounts of money as a tool to be able to, to, to do other things, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't so much about hoarding money. It was about being able to do other things that you wanted to do in your life. And one of those things was to be able to make my own movies. You actually were able to pursue acting as a career for some time. Tell me about that time of your life. You ever want to go back and do something over again? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the things I thought I, I, I would like to go back and do over again. Yeah, I did. I did Pursuit for, for a while. And mm -hmm. I, I think I did like 19 or 20 movies I, I was able mm -hmm. to be on, be in rather. Um, I did uh, some commercials. Um, I did some print work. I've done, you know, along in, including those 19 or 20 films were some industrial uh, projects, industrial films. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was very interesting for me because one thing I learned about acting it's like any other skill. There's some right. people who do it really, really well, which is why some of them are successful. But mm -hmm. then again, you have people like Paulie Shore, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, and then right. you know, there are people who are mediocre and then there are people who are just like, when the right role comes along, that's what they do well, right? Mm -hmm. I felt mm -hmm. as though I would, if I were, if I had become a successful actor, it would have to be the right role for me to come along where I could, that role would not so much be a stretch for me, but it would simply be an extension of who I am, right? right. Because the interesting thing about acting, like I did a, a, a small film one time and Mark, it was weird because I felt as though there was another personality inside me. Mm. Mm -hmm. right? And it took about a week to decouple from that personality interesting right and it was at that point when i made the because that was that was when you know i'm like okay i'm getting more work here this all this stuff's good because a lot, of, a lot of the other stuff i did was like you know we call it day player but i guess you mm -hmm. could say extra <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or featured extra work right right and you know it was at that point where I started to rethink the whole thing because mm -hmm. I don't want to feel as though my body is being possessed or I don't want to feel as though I am mani manifesting another personality that's not a part of who I am, right? Because mm -hmm. then I'm not really being me. It, it was a whole thing I, you know, that was in my head for like a, a while. So yeah. that was when I've kind of made, it, made the decision to say, that's what started it. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, maybe I did not do the right thing by pursuing this avenue. It's really interesting that you say that because what it sounds like to me is that one of the key reasons that you actually got out of acting was that it didn't allow you to be authentic. You know, I never thought about that. <laughs> but mm. you, yeah, you could say that. There was, I did a stage play one January many years ago. Yeah, I was living in Center City, and it was at a theater downtown. And the parts were there were there were short skits, right? There was like five of them that each of us had to do. The the guy who's the director, the part that I was given for the for the one skit, it was just so uncomfortable to me. He said to me, "You sound like William Shatner being Captain Kirk," right? <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Well, I watch a lot of Star Trek, so that might have something." <laughs> To do is that it. a compliment? I know, right? Like, you're not insulting me. <laughs> so he then switched, he made myself and the other actors switch roles, mm. right? And when I played the other role, I knocked it out of the park, mm. right? Mm. He was like, that's mm. awesome. You, okay, that's, that's your new character. And the other guy played the other person. Right. Right. <laughs> the Shatner role. Yeah, yeah, right, the Shatner role. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So I guess to some degree, Mark, you could say that. There's another large contributing factor to me stopping that, but that was one half of it. When I realized that being an actor means that you're pretending to be somebody or something that you're not. I had a very hard time pretending to be something or somebody that I'm not. What was the other thing that led you to away from acting? That was the catalyst leading me into real estate. My good friend, Michael Antemeyer, whom you've met. I was working as a campaign manager 
I gave myself the title campaign manager because it was just he and I really, <laughs> right. campaign, the candidate and his manager. We were coming towards the end of his first political campaign. Mm -hmm. And my friend Michael is a successful business guy. He's an attorney, worked as a prosecutor, both for the city and for the state. Now he's an attorney in private practice. You know, he's a very smart guy. And he said to me, well, he said, what are we going to do with you after, after this campaign? Or what are you going to do after the campaign? I said, I don't know. I'll figure it out. He said, are you tired of being a starving actor? I said, as a matter of fact, now that you mentioned it, I think I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, it's cool when you're 20, not so much when you're 30. And he said, I'm going to make you rich. <laughs> wow. I thought, <laughs> great, finally, somebody's going to adopt me, right? <laughs> Someone's going to adopt me in the family. Are they going to write me a check or gonna, you're going to adopt me? He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> he laughed. Mm. And he said, listen, if you put half as much work into real estate as you did into that campaign, he mm. said, you will do so well, you'll, be, you'll surpass most people in this business. Because most people in the real estate business don't even show up, right? He said to me, I feel like half of life is simply showing up. And he said, Dre... I am surprised, or you'd be surprised, how many people in the business world don't even show up. And by the way, that was the fourth time a successful business person said to me, what are you doing with your life? You should come and work for me, mm. <laughs> right? Wow. I like you, right? If yeah. you come and work for me, I guarantee you'll do well, Yeah. right? So I figured, hey, you know what? I'm not 21 anymore, right? I should probably take this guy up on this offer. Yeah. Right. And I did. And that was how I got into the business. Did you ever hit a low point or a defining moment that served as a major turning point for you? Yes, I, I, I have. There's been a couple of them. You know, I went to New York one weekend to do two, three auditions. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I had two on a Saturday and one on a Sunday. Wow. Right? And I had a bag with me. And I fell asleep on a, on a bench in Manhattan. Right? <laughs> I know, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay, dude. Because I laugh about it too, right? <laughs> and, you know, I think to my, like, I woke up from this nap. <laughs> right? <laughs> and... And I'm replaying my entire life in my head. <laughs> mm. You know, I'm going over everything in my head that's led me to this point. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I was like, I, I really need to rethink this whole thing, you know. <laughs> and mind you, Mark, there are a lot of people who I know, like Jim Carrey lived in his car. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of successful actors who, who reach that point, that low point, if, if you will, and suffered yeah. for their craft, right? Right. I'm not that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like there are things I don't mind suffering for. Like I will suffer whatever I have to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ mm. and for my faith, mm -hmm. right? I will suffer what I have to suffer for my wife, my daughter, my family, and when I say family, I mean close friends. I mean people like you, right? I will not suffer to be an actor mm. because it wasn't that, you know, one of the things about me, Mark, and yeah, I don't know if you've realized this or not, you probably have because you, you're a good rereader and you probably know me better than I know myself. But one of the things about me is that I have no gripes about dropping whatever I'm doing and leaving. Mm -hmm. As a young man, I've had so many jobs. One job, I was a telemarketer for this place over in Bryn Mawr once, right? I think it lasted about a month, right? <laughs> and the supervisor, the supervisor would always listen to our calls, yeah. right? And you have a script and they want you to follow that script to the T. Comes over to me and says, Andre, you're not following the script, <laughs> right? I said, I know. He said, well, why not? I said, well, who talks like this? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm like, who talks like this? Like, nobody talks like this. Right? Right, right? And not only that, Mark, a lot of the words in that script made me stutter. 
Oh, yeah. Right? And that was my biggest issue with it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, listen, I don't care that nobody talks like whatever is in the script, right? right. It, it sounded ridiculous to me, but that's okay. I right. was given the job to do. I'm going to do the job to, to the best of my ability. But because I stuttered, it impeded my ability to do my job properly. Yeah, yeah. So I improvised or I changed the words around, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I said, listen, if I'm getting sales, what difference does it make if I follow the script or not? Right. You know, to the to the T. He said, it doesn't matter. You got to follow the script. This is what the client wants. Yeah. I'm like, I thought the client would just want results. Right. Sales. Like, How about that? Right. right? So <laughs> right. he said, listen, if you don't follow the script, you got to leave. You, mm. you can't work here. I said, all right, cool. Thanks. No hard feelings. I'm out. <laughs> all right, you were talking about low points, yeah. right? Sleeping on the bench, <laughs> right? Falling, mm. taking my nap on the park bench. Having these, listen, I don't want to demean anybody by calling them dead end jobs, but mm -hmm. you know, for some people they are, for other people, hey, they're perfectly satisfied with that. The other low point in my life that caused me to shift the direction that I was going in was, you know, my former friend and now dead, now de deceased former friend, Kenny, mm -hmm. you know, and Kenny and I were close as you know, yeah. and I was seeing a young lady and Kenny thought that she was too good for me or I was good enough for her because she is what he envisioned in a girl mm. and he deserves her more than me. So she should be with him. And when this all came to a head, I realized that Kenny was playing me behind my back wow. and he betrayed me. I referred to him as Judas for quite some time. Yeah. And that was a very hurtful thing because yeah. again, they, being single and in our twenties, we dated a lot. And I've met girls who <laughs> one girl gave me the phone number. I asked her for her number. She gave me a number, but it was the phone number for the gay and lesbian task force. Right? Oh I thought that was so funny. <laughs> 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 I thought that was so funny. I wanted to meet her again, just to say, give her a high five and say, that was that was good <laughs> yeah you got me, <laughs> yeah, you got me right? so um yeah, no. when when all this kind of exploded kenny and mine's friendship fell apart he threatened to shoot me right wow. and it, it was really bad and i mean i cried i cried because not so much that i wasn't you know because this girl didn't want to see me but i cried because a gentleman who i thought was one of my best and closest friends yeah i'd used everything that he knew about the relationship between myself and this young lady used it and betrayed me with it. Yeah. Right. And that really hurt. And that was also a turning point in my life. Yeah. And looking back, Mark, and I knew this at the time because, you know, my involvement with Kenny, Kenny and mine's involvement as friends, you know, we, we didn't grow up the same. And, you know, there were things that I was influenced to do because of him that I otherwise would not have done, mm. you know, places that I went that I otherwise would not have gone, right? Mm -hmm. And I knew that it would take an act of God for our, to, to sever our friendship. And that's, mm -hmm. that's, what it, that's what it was. And because of that, you know, I started down the road that I should have been on in the first place. And one of those things was to reignite my relationship with and, and pursue a relationship with Christ mm -hmm. rather than, being selfish and living for myself. Those were a, a few of the turning points in my life. Low points, yeah. if you will. Like that whole thing was, with Kenny was a very, very, very low point for me in my life. And as an epilogue to that story, actually, Kenny, he actually ended up committing suicide. That's exactly right. Which wasn't the first time that he tried that. It was the second or third time he yeah. succeeded. He walked into an oncoming Amtrak train. And, um, Partly, there was a couple of reasons why. I, I spoke to his mom after I found out because the, wow. the young lady who he betrayed me for is mm. the one who found me on social media and she's in Germany. And by the mm. way, after their little fling or whatever it was that, that they had for the two months that she had left here in the United States, he never saw her again after that, right? Wow. She came back here for a week and he was in Chicago when that happened, right? Yeah. So they had this phone relationship long distance yeah and you know 
um, uh, he wanted her to move to move back here to be with him. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, I can't because you don't have a place for me to be. You don't have a home for us, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he um, told her that she betrayed him, um, yelled at her, hung up the phone, said, I never want to see you again. Um, yelled at his mother, say to her, take a look at my face because you'll never see it again, right? Mm -hmm. And then not long after that, killed himself. It's a very tragic end. And it's a shame because you you knew Kenny. Like, I he's did. a funny guy. He's a funny he's guy. Hilarious. He's a great guy. But he had a dark side to him that he was never able to properly manage or deal with. And I believe that's what led to the circumstance that led to his death. You have developed a career, a very successful career in real estate. If you were to give someone advice, the, the process by which you went through to get to where you are now, how would you describe that? It's very simple. First of all, the older I get, the more I realize I really don't know much of anything. <laughs> right? I really, you and me I'm, both, brother. <laughs> like, I used to think I was smart. Come to find out I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> like, my wife is smart, right? Yeah, mine too. <laughs> yeah, and I'm just like, huh? <laughs> Right, right. They both right. are very smart women, right? They, they really are. I'm still yeah. wondering yeah. why she picked me, but hey, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right, we married up, right? <laughs> Absolutely, we, we married up. <laughs> One of the things that I've learned in life, Mark, is that things are not that complicated. And one of my issues with schools, because my wife and her siblings were all homeschooled, right? This was never anything I was ever exposed to. And now that, you know, after you leave school, you go to college, you go out into the world, right? You know, you, you're, you're, your horizons broaden because you're meeting people from different walks of life and you see how other people live and every, you see everyone has a story and everyone has an amazing story. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And one of my issues with school is that I do not believe that schools, public schools, teach people a skill in order mm -hmm. for them to better themselves in life, right? They, that, that was what college, high school and colleges were for, right? So even colleges now, you know, I had a difficult time in high school. I went to community college and then another college for like a year, year and a half, right? Uh, one of them I did online, you know, uh, um, part-time um, about 15 years ago, right? And unless you are going for a particular trade or skill or profession, part of my issue with colleges are these humanities studies, right? Complete waste of time and money. Mm. I, I shouldn't say complete. They tend to be a waste of time and money. <laughs> right? If, if you're going to college and you're in the hole $150,000, $200,000, right? And you're coming out and you're only making $60,000 a year. Gross. If you're lucky. Right? If you're lucky. Right. <laughs> that's not a good return on investment, right? Mm -hmm. Because how long, how long is it going to take you to pay off that loan with the interest and if you're late, penalties, right? That is, to me, I mean, I could be wrong. Again, I, I admit I'm not that smart of a guy, but I realize that that does not appear to be a good return on investment. What I wish someone had done for me when I was younger and in, in school was to simply recognize and identify my skill set right? Mm. And then encourage me and push me in that direction, right? Nobody did that. It is only by the grace of God. You know, again, I said Michael was the fourth person after high school to recognize and acknowledge a skill set that they saw in me and encouraged me. For anyone who's in school, mm. who's not sure whether it's high school, college, postgraduate, right? Doesn't matter. The most important thing I believe is to recognize your skill set, mm, right? Mm -hmm. Once you recognize what you're good at, right, then you should do whatever you can to pursue or that career path. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you're good at two things, you know, you have a backup plan just in case, right? right. But recognize your skill set and pursue that skill set. And the most important thing when it comes to being a success or doing well in life. Yeah. It's very simple. You don't give up. I know you probably know this, but you know, for those who are gonna watch this, I would say, 
you know, one of the best speeches ever given in the history of mankind was by Sir Winston Churchill. Mm. <laughs> That is the, commence, the commencement speech that he gave. The guy sat there for two minutes and said, never, ever, 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 never, ever, 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 ever give up. That was it. And then he sat down. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> like, right. It's amazing advice. <laughs> it's amazing advice. And yeah. like, it's, it's incredible. You know, other people that I've known in my life say that one of the things that they admire about me is my tenacity. And that... I don't really hear the word no. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay? Right. Like, to me, you say no or can't, that's quitter talk. Ever seen the movie Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn Ross? But there's, there's a great line in it. This young broker goes over and gets coffee. And his sales manager is like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm getting coffee. He goes, put that down. Coffee's for closers. You're a loser. Get back. <laughs> you know, until, until you start closing deals, you don't get any coffee. <laughs> <laughs> right? Coffee's for closer. <laughs> Coffee's for closer. Right? <laughs> That's right? brilliant. My, my, my guys and I, you know, always make, you know, we always used to make, make that joke, right? And it's, it's incredible to me how many people give up, or as my friend Michael Untermeyer point, pointed out to me when we began this journey, just mm -hmm. don't show up. There is the societal standards that we sometimes feel as though we need to meet in order to be considered a success or mm. these avenues that society in general gives that you have to go down to be considered a success or to be considered somebody, right? right. So, you know, like one of the things about me, I, I've just never really cared, mm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. about those standards because coming from where I came from, you know, my great grandmother always used to say to me, my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother, my entire family always said to me, listen, if you don't work, you don't eat. It's very simple, right? That's my mindset in me pursuing the things that I pursue in my life. You just don't give up, right? Right? Because it doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. It's simply a matter of how many times you get back up. Abraham Lincoln is a perfect example. Mike Tyson did not become the fierce world champion that, that he was by giving up. If you believe in something, if you want to do something with your life, you need to pursue that avenue and do not let anyone tell you otherwise. Amazing. Amazing advice. So bring us up to the present. How would you describe your life today? I have to say, praise God that I've had a wonderful life. I feel like I have not yet began to live. My wife, who you know, is a successful uh, executive at a very famous wirehouse. I'm not gonna say their name. Again, I'm like, why did she pick me? <laughs> right? um, my wife and I are discussing doing something together in business, right? So it appears, Mark, that everything that I've done, all the jobs I've had, mm -hmm. remember when I was a courier for so mm -hmm. many years? Oh yeah. Right. And your sister even said to me, Dre, like, you need to, like, leave this job because you don't look yourself. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're not your cheery self. I'm like, yeah, it's depressing. Yeah. I'm by myself on the road all day, you know? Yeah. But um, who, who would have thought having that job would really be an asset in my profession now, right? Mm -hmm. Because I used to drive between three to 500 miles a day sometimes, yeah. right? Wow. I now know the Delaware Valley like nobody's business. And mm -hmm. that, is, that is a tremendous value to me being in the real estate business. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it really is. Like I said, praise God that I've come from where I started to where I am. And it is, it is nothing short than an act of God and, and the grace of the Lord as to why I am in the position that I'm in. Having a nine-month-old is a totally different challenge, <laughs> right. right? Again, a totally different skill set that's needed. I could not be happier. When you're you, it's one thing. Looking from the out, people from the outside looking in is totally, you know, it's a totally different ball game. I have a good life. I have a wonderful, beautiful, smart wife. We have a, a beautiful baby. As you know, we purchased a house which belonged to friends, parents that we both know, yeah. and. This was 
you know, up until that time, this was like the nicest house I'd ever been in in my whole life. You know, I was like, wow, that's a mansion. <laughs> like, that's, just, that's a big house, right? Circumstances just so had it that, you know, we were looking to buy, they were looking to sell, and we, were, we couldn't find what we wanted. And um, another broker for a house that we, that we made an offer on in New Jersey tried to get us into a bidding war. Mm. You know, and I'm like, dude, you, you have no idea who I am or what I do, do you? <laughs> like, I'm not playing that game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, like um, we are, we are good. I think this whole COVID thing has really adversely affected a lot, affected a lot of people um, mm -hmm. emotionally and psychologically. You know, I'm God willing that this will pass soon, soon enough, and we can get back to our lives. I don't think we will ever go back to the normal that you and I knew as kids growing up, right. you know, but it's a, it's, it's a new world and that's okay. It is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, right now I, I'm looking to expand my business in a few different ways. My brokerage that I'm with is, is licensed in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Maryland. So we do business from New York down to DC. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and now my wife and I are looking to begin to build a portfolio for ourselves so that we can create something for our families. Because again, my wife grew up on a farm, you know, yeah. also very humble beginnings. Our families are pleased with the success that we've had in our lives, considering where we started and where we are. And thus you have the American dream by God's grace. How did you and Heidi meet? I guess... Me telling you she lost a bet would not be acceptable, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's honest. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually met because of her mom. Her mom, mm. I met her mom uh, because of business. And we had like a, a coffee meeting uh, to discuss how we can do business together. And the more we talked, um, she realized where I was coming from as far as personal values. And she said to me, you should meet my daughter. I'm thinking not another woman thinking I should meet her daughter. Right, right. right. Like, kind of pulling me off to her daughter. And um, uh, she said, oh, my daughter is so beautiful. My mm. daughter is like this beautiful girl. And I'm thinking, I can't imagine any mother that didn't think their daughter was beautiful, right? Right. She said, oh, my daughter's a gym rat. She's always at the gym. I'm like, yeah, me too. I go to the gym. I see who's at the gym, right? Then she said to me, oh, my daughter was in Miss USA and Miss America, Miss Pennsylvania. And I thought, listen, I'll be friends with anybody. I'll hang out with your daughter, you know, I'll meet her. Right, right. <laughs> you know? right. And you know, that, that was kind of how, how we met. You know, um, my mother-in-law name is Karen. And, mm. um, you know, Karen forced the issue with Heidi because Heidi <laughs> didn't want to meet anybody because she wasn't dating for a year. Mm. And uh, Karen, Karen said, you really need to meet this guy. Eight years later, here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that is that is so awesome, and it and and a very unlikely story, you know, the the, the mom setting you up with you know, right. That's, you know, that's actually pretty. That's actually a pretty cool story. Suddenly, I'm not so against arranged marriages. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not saying you have, and you know, right. th thinking about it, our parents have a unique perspective. I have a bird's eye point of view that we probably wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Right. And because they're older than us, they can probably see things that we weren't able to see being younger. It's you true. know, That's and very true. I'm thinking to myself, you know what, this is, this is probably not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how has being a husband and a father changed you? Well, it's calmed me down a lot. I don't go out at night anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, um, no. I, I have to stay in one place for more than an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, listen, it's a different pace, um, but it is the next chapter of our lives, you know, yourself included, you know, but you have two very beautiful young ladies, you know, um, and, and you, have, you have this awesome, beautiful wife and God bless you both. I love you guys. Um, you know, but it's been, it, it, it's different. Um, it's, just, it's a slower pace for me. You know, yeah. you've known me for a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I'm not like, I don't grass doesn't normally grow under my feet you know right <laughs> and <laughs> right it's it's a completely different pace but you know it's called being an adult you adjust because it's no longer about me this party has nothing to do with me anymore 
It's mm. about Mrs. Watson and our daughter and our families, our mothers particularly. You know, being a father has really given me perspective. Remember the scene from Bad Boys where the young man came to the door to take out Martin Lawrence's daughter? I dread that day. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I find myself being more protective. Um, I find myself mm. being, um, taking less risk. I catch myself, you know, because I'm somewhat impulsive, you know, and I catch myself going, did I do that? When <laughs> right. first time in my life, I never right. would have even, I never would have crossed my mind about right. questioning whether I could do something or not. I just did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so being a husband and a father is a very humbling experience. You know, Indeed. it changes your, pers your perspective. And it's also made me appreciate the family unit more so. You know, mm -hmm. I see how difficult it is for if my wife is here alone or she has our, our baby alone and is trying to feed her, give her a bath and plus other things are going on, plus having to work, being, yeah. being a parent and working is like, like they're two full time jobs. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know how single parents are able to raise not just one, but like multiple children at a time. I, I salute them. Hats off to them. Hats off to parents, you know, both single and in the traditional family unit who are able to raise children because, man, it is hard. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to your younger self? I would say finish everything that you start. There are very few regrets that I have in my life, right? Mm -hmm. I don't regret getting up and walking out of a, of a job that clearly was not for me. I will never hesitate to walk away from something that I'm uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. you know? But I would definitely tell my former self to finish what you started, mm -hmm. stay the course. Yeah. Just stay the course. For you, being a husband and parent has been a really positive experience. Do you ever think, boy, I wish I did this sooner? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But had I done that, I never would have met my wife. And, you know, we, we, we gel. One of my uncles asked me one time, what are you waiting for? I said, I'm waiting for the right woman to come into my life. He yeah. said, no such thing. <laughs> he said, there's no such thing. You either make it work or you don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know, one can argue that, you know, till the sun sets, but I would say, that by God's grace, I found the woman that's right for me. If I could, I, I, we would have 10, 10 kids, mm. right? But, you know, we're both not in our 20s. There's times I'm like, man, I should have done this sooner. But, you know, all, all things in, in, in the right time. So happily ever afters are never without their challenges. How do you cope with challenge when it comes your way? It's a great, it's a great question, Mark. And you know, my wife always tells me, she's like, she goes, sometimes I wish I could handle things the way that you do, mm. right? Like, I don't really stress things, man. I, 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 just, I don't, because I have no control over it, yeah. right? The, the only thing that I can control is my reaction to it and the way that I handle it, right? And again, the older you get, the more you realize that you have very little control over, over very little, right? right? You yourself is the one thing that you have a degree of, full control over, mm. right? Mm. I, if, if I can't do anything about it, I just keep moving. What is the greatest lesson that you've learned, either in life or in business, that you would share with someone else? Good question. I don't know that I can say that it's one thing. You know the Stephen Covey book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of those habits is to begin with the end in mind. The older I get, the more I go along in life is the more I realize that this is all gonna to come to an end one day. I need to do my best to prepare myself for that end, right? Mm -hmm. Thus, my continued daily pursuit of a relationship with Christ. And I see how people behave who don't know God. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, in an interview, I think it was maybe with Time Magazine, I don't recall, it was a long time ago. Yeah. But I recall reading this interview with him and he said something very interesting. He said, if I came from apes or evolved from monkeys, right, mm -hmm. then after I die, that's it. And there is, no, there, there, is, there, is, there is no recourse for anything that I've done in my life. Yeah. So I'm just going to adhere to whatever my desires are.
so many other examples of people who do not know Christ or do, who do not know God, right? And the way that they behave themselves. And I, I think that for me, that relationship and that foundation with, with Christ has been to me the, I want to say that it's, 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 it's the foundation on, on which I stand, you know, mm-hmm. but then like, you know, I'm a flawed guy. So like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't always do the things that I want to do, say the things that I want to say, you know, and some of the things that goes through my mind, I, I know they should, you know, but whether it's my personal life or in business, I try to apply those Christ-like principles mm-hmm. because I am moving forward with the end in mind. And once this ends, I will then have to meet my maker. Yeah. Right. And I want to meet on good terms. I want to meet him <laughs> on his terms, right. not on my terms. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you know, and the other thing too, Mark, is that in our culture in this day and age, I find people to be lazy. So I don't want to say that it'll be easy to outwork somebody, but yeah. persistence and consistency will get you a lot farther than having a PhD or a JD or, you know, any kind of an advanced degree. What do you want most for your life? What I want for this life, what I want for my life is for when I leave this life and step into eternity, I want to be able to hear from my, from my maker, well mm-hmm. done, come on in. Listen, I have everything that I want. Yeah. I'm not in need of anything and I'm a simple mm-hmm. man. You know, I, I used to think I was a sophisticated, but I'm not, <laughs> right? I'm a very simple man. I eat meat, right? Mm-hmm. I like steak, I like chicken, I, I like lamb, I like pork, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I eat meat, I like to cook my meat over an open fire, right? I, 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 have, my, I have my family, right? I have my friends, you know, and I have a career that I, that I love, you know? And I, I do my best, to help people whenever I can, however I can. I try to encourage those who are going through a hard time. Some, somebody else who you know that from school, um, you know, as she, she's a, um, a guidance counselor at a middle school. And I, she asked me to come and speak once in a while. And I do, you know, and you know, it's in lower Delaware County where, you know, some, some of the families don't always have the means to be able to properly provide for the kids every day, you know, some kids might miss a meal, right? Because yeah. they don't have it. So one of the things I do when I go there is I give out money. Wow. <laughs> but wow. I, I ask questions, you know, yeah. that they, you know, usually historic, historical questions. And, mm. you know, like, listen, I, I do my best to help my fellow man. And at, at the end of the day, that's really all, all we can do. So at this point, I want to open it up for you to share any final thoughts with us is there anything that i haven't asked you that you think would be helpful for us to know in terms of how to find or how to live your happily ever after yeah you know i i I would say find your one thing there's actually a book called the one thing (laughs) by gary keller um which is a great book and i would say also the society in which in which we live now is is very much misguided like popular culture is misguided you know And I think it would be very important for people to kind of learn history, um, yeah. learn why the, U- the United States is the nation that it is, mm-hmm. why it's become the single most successful nation or empire or republic in the history of the world, mm-hmm. right? It's very important to know those reasons why before you go, before anyone you know, would go and criticize them and say, this is horrible, right? Mm-hmm. I would say to people, find your one thing, find something that you're good at, whatever that skill set is, focus on that skill set, harness that, sharpen that saw, you know, mm-hmm. um, and don't hang out with losers, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because, you know, you're going to become the sum of who you associate yourself with, right? So if you're going to associate yourself with losers, guess what? You're now going to be a loser <laughs> or be known right. as, as a loser right? <laughs> Nobody wants to be a loser. Don't be a loser. <laughs> be closer so you, you can get some coffee. Uh, That's right. <laughs> you know that, and listen, I would also say to anyone 
you know, who's listening or who would care to take, take my advice for whatever it might be worth, our days on this earth are finite, yeah. right? We're not going to be here in this body. Like 100 years from now, everyone within the sound of our, everyone who's watching this video, right, or who hears our voices won't be here, yeah. right? So where will you be? <laughs> right, mm -hmm. I, I would encourage everyone to seek God and to make peace with your maker because yeah. one day you will be face to face with him. Yeah. Andre, this has been an amazing time together <laughs> as it is always. Uh, thank you. you so much for taking time away from your family, away from your, your work to spend uh, some time with me answering a few of my uh, questions. Uh, where can people find you online? So if you go to crephilly.com or uh, kwcommercialglobalpartners.com or you can just Google my name. If you Google Andre Watson, commercial real estate, or Andre Watson Real Estate, I'm easy to find. I'm more than all happy to offer advice or, you know, assessment of your asset, okay? And, you know, um, hopefully, you know, if you're looking to invest in real estate, whether it's for the first time or you're looking to unload your assets or expand your portfolio, looking for some office space, medical space, retail space, right? Myself or someone on my team are more than qualified to be of, of, of assistance. As someone who has known Andre for more than 30 years, I can <laughs> fully attest to his level of character and, and his ability to, to support you in any of your either, either business needs or personal needs. Find <laughs> him, connect with him. He's an amazing human being. And I feel like the world is better for having him in it. Andre, uh, thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Mark.